All right, we're going to get started. How's everyone doing this evening? Good. I want to welcome you to New York Law School. I'm Anthony Krell. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the dean and president here. And it is a true honor to host our celebration tonight, celebrating the most recent work and to listen to one of our most prominent and impressive scholars, Professor Richard Chusett. So as Dean of New York Law School, I know how fortunate our institution has been to have Richard as a member of the faculty for the last eight years, and he came here to MYLS after serving 35 years at Georgetown University Law Center. He has been indeed a prolific producer of scholarship for over his entire four decades in the legal academy, and we can say with many of our scholars that they have too many works to name, but in Richard's case, that actually rings quite true. He's produced an enviable library of published works and continues to do so at a rapid pace. His expertise is so broad and deep, writing extensively on topics of property, copyright, family law, the legal history of both gender and property law, and teaching texts in copyright, property, and legal history. His work has always received accolades, and most recently his article, Appropriate created moments was named one of the best articles on entertainment and art law published in 2015. He's also been a leader nationally in a number of different legal and academic organizations and his new work that we are celebrating this evening, Gendered Law in American History, co-authored with Professor Wendy Williams from Georgetown, is the latest evidence of his tireless scholarship and it couldn't be more topical. This seminal work explores cultural and legal developments from the turn of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, including concepts of citizenship at the founding of the Republic, the development of married women's property laws, divorce, child custody, temperance, suffrage, domestic and racial violence before and after the Civil War, protective labor legislation, and the use of legal history, testimony in legal disputes. <clears throat> I'm sure this will soon be um, a valued resource in law classrooms around the country, and it will make a significant contribution to how new lawyers understand the role of gender in the development and practice of law. In fact, even eight years after his departure, Georgetown Law Center still maintains and make publicly available online a repository of hundreds of student papers written by Richard students from when he taught his seminar there called Law and Gender in American History. Tonight's talk couldn't be more relevant, coming exactly one week before an immensely consequential election in which the United States could see its first female president elected. And even though there's this historical milestone before us, we can all agree that this election wasn't necessarily supposed to be about gender, but that's certainly what it's become in recent months. It's kind of extraordinary to think about it, for that the second straight open election without an incumbent our country has a chance to make history. Just like with President Obama's election, in parallel with this election, and in many ways because of it, our nation is undergoing a massive re-examination of cultural, political, legal, social, and private norms. Never has the opportunity for true gender equality been so promising, and yet, with the explosion of different modes of communication, including social media, the ability to engage in misogyny and bias has never been greater as well. <clears throat> her, candidacy, it, her candidacy itself has been a case study in this, with the standards used to evaluate Hillary Clinton and the language employed differs grace, greatly than in past elections. Further, with her opponent fully embracing the gender difference in both direct and subtle ways, this has become a more central uh, feature of this election, uh, almost an, an, an other policy discussion. As Gloria Steinem recently said in an NPR interview, <clears throat> as significant as it would be, even if Hillary Clinton wins, we are not entering a post-gender society anytime soon. Nevertheless, the discussions, policies, and cultural shifts we are witnessing makes for interesting times. Richard's talk today will be very illuminating and help put much of this in context. I know Professor Williams wished she could have been here tonight for this wonderful celebration, and she asked me to read the following. <clears throat> Dear Richard, I so wish I could be in New York today to celebrate you and your achievement. What a journey we and our book have traveled over these many years. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking our work of three decades over the top of the mountain into the world of print. <clears throat> 
with love, respect, and a touch of awe. Wendy Williams, Professor Emerita, Georgetown Law. Indeed, Richard's entire career has been an incredible journey. And I share Professor Williams' awe. And I want to say that Richard is one of a kind in the legal academy. And we're blessed to continue to benefit from his never-ending and tireless efforts to illuminate many of the important and topical legal issues of the day. And this is what makes him an invaluable and unmatched contributor to legal scholarship in our school. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Richard Chusett. So first, Anthony, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And you're obviously also do a second thank you uh, for arranging to hold this event. I really appreciate it. And your ongoing generosity and support as uh, certainly um, I take to heart. So Gendered Law in American History is dedicated to my wife, who's sitting in the middle in the back. And actually, our son, Sam, is in the front row here. Um, Elizabeth Langer, and to her mother, Nikki Langer, Elizabeth's strong feminist instincts have frequently served as a corrective for me. They were critical, I think, to my ability to produce this book. And those instincts arose from a strong foundation. Her mother, now 94, uh, was born shortly after women obtained national suffrage rights. She was an early feminist herself, an accomplished musician who played French horn in the first all-women's orchestra in the history of this city, and became later a professor of psychology at Hofstra. So that's her. Um, in college and at our wedding in 1974. So here's my talk, entitled Gender, Stamina, and Politics. Hillary Clinton stumbled while departing early from a New York City ceremony marking the 15th anniversary of 9-11. She's leaning against a bollard there at the end of a fence being held up by a, 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 a staff member. Trump right. responded you like You look this. at what's going on in the Middle East. When they bomb these cities and they're leveled, you can imagine how many people die. She has been a disaster. But here's a woman. She's supposed to fight all of these different things. And she can't make it 15 feet to her car. Give me a break. Give me a break. Give me a break. She's home resting right now. She's getting ready for her next speech, which is going to be about 15 minutes, and it's going to be in two or three days. Needless Folks, to say, there were, we um, there were a bunch of uh, cartoon commentaries about it later on. This is after the first debate. Clinton, as it turns out, was in the midst of fighting off what turned out to be a mild case of pneumonia. She rested at her daughter's apartment before returning home to Chappaqua to rest up for a couple of days. And health, of course, has been a common topic of discussion during the ongoing campaign, not only that 9-11 incident, but for months before and after. In an Associated Press report posted on the New York Times website just after her stumble on 9-11, it was said, now Clinton is sure to face new questions about whether she's physically fit for the presidency. Trump and his supporters have been hinting at potential health issues for months, questioning Clinton's stamina when she takes routine days off the campaign trail, and reviving questions about a concussion she sustained in December after fainting, December 2012. Her doctor attributed that response, that episode, to a stomach virus and dehydration. Even after the lengthy, tawdry election campaign we have witnessed, the content of that little tidbit, though hardly noticed by anyone at the time, was really remarkable. It was part of an ongoing tendency of the press to take seriously Trump's assertions and those of his supporters that Clinton was not in good health, that she was weak, susceptible to fainting, unrecovered from a concussion sustained four years earlier, and therefore that she lacked the stamina required to handle the rigors of the presidency. And that media tendency was in the teeth of a career entailing eight active years as first lady, eight years as the peripatetic successful senator from New York, four grueling years as President Obama's secretary of state, visiting 112 countries and traveling, you ready for this, 956,733 miles, significantly more than any other secretary in our history. 
and vigorous participation in two seemingly interminable presidential election campaigns. Certainly her career has been at least as taxing, if not more so than Trump's during the same time period. And up until the time AP released its little news clip, no one said much of anything about Trump's tendency toward bad health, he's borderline obese, and weakness, his exercise regimen he quips consists of waving his arms at speeches. Nor did anyone ask whether he is subject to fainting spells or slow to recover from accidents or subject to any other maladies, even though he and Clinton are approximately the same age. Only in recent days have a few commentators, most notably Amanda Hess in the October 16th New York Times Sunday Magazine, have they begun to call out the stamina affair as gendered. So something both distressing and interesting actually is going on. This, of course, is hardly the first time that women's mental and physical capacities have played a part in the public's and the legal system's reluctance to tolerate their efforts to seek out roles traditionally occupied by men. While Trump has been more tawdry and demeaning about this issue than any other prominent political personality in my lifetime, probably everybody's lifetime, the cultural strain of belief that women are not mentally or physically capable of assuming roles long occupied by men has been with us for a very long time. Trump, in short, has tapped into a deep strain in American culture. It is a small part of that historical strain that I'd like to chat about this evening. An event sticks in my memory, though I can't exactly place the year, probably sometime in the 1980s. In any case, Elizabeth and I were at a flea market that first opened in 1972 at the Chomark Community Methodist Church on Martha's Vineyard where, as many of you know, we have spent time for over 45 years. Elizabeth's mom lives there. I sat down on the church steps to wait while Elizabeth finished browsing, and serendipitously there was a box of old books as my seatmate. My eyes fixed on a small green volume by Dr. Edward H. Clark, pictured here, entitled Six Sex in Education or a Fair Chance for Girls. Later I learned that Clark was a member of the Harvard Board of Overseers, a former member of the school's medical faculty and a highly respected physician. Thought of by liberal women in Boston as their friend because of earlier speeches he had made criticizing men who had driven women out of medical classrooms in Philadelphia in the late 1860s. He was invited in 1873 to speak at the New England Women's Club of Boston on the education of women. The talk took place during an ongoing controversy about whether women should be admitted to Harvard College. The release two years before, in 1871, of Charles Darwin's The Descent of Man and his notion that sexual divergence was a critical feature of evolution became an important moment in the cultural and legal history of women in the United States. Clark was deeply influenced by Darwin's work and developed a theory he thought conformed to the idea that a species flourished when men competed for women with whom to reproduce. When Clark spoke to the New England Women's Club in 1873, he focused on the physiological and psychological nature of women as an inherent natural limitation on their ability to tolerate the typical structure of male educational regimes. The need to protect the reproductive capacities of women was a critical part of recognizing the influence of Darwin's sexual divergence. The open-minded women, women in the women's club audience received his words with a degree of hostility, a reception that led Clark to pen his ideas at greater length and produced the volume I came upon at the flea market. The version I purchased for pennies was actually the fifth edition, published in 1874, only one year after its original release date. So it immediately appeared to me on the church step that it was a very widely read little tome. That's the reason I bought it. Um, an impression I later confirmed. Its influence was significant. In all, 17 editions were released. The cultural strands it helped unleash stand to this day. So Clark and other scientists of his day believed in a distinct theory of sexual divergence. Each person had three basic God-given systems in their body, a trinity in our anatomy, as he called it. The first was the nutritive system, including the digestive, circulatory, and other basic life-sustaining structures. The nervous <clears throat> and intelligence system was number two, and the third, not surprisingly, was the reproductive system, quote, by which the race is continued. Only the first two were the same in men and women, and so Clark opined in his book. Woman, in the interest of the race, is dowered with a set of organs peculiar to herself, whose complexity, delicacy, sympathies, and force 
are among the marvels of creation. If properly nurtured and cared for, they are a source of strength and power to her. If neglected and mismanaged, they retaliate upon their possessor with weakness and disease as well as of the mind as of the body. God was not in error when after Eve's creation, he looked upon his work and pronounced it good. Let Eve take a wise care of the temple God made for her and Adam of the one made for him, and both will enter upon a career whose glory and beauty no seer has foretold, our poet sang. Very 19th, yeah, very 19th century English. And a bit further on, Clark continued, when the divergence of the sexes becomes obvious to the most careless observer, the complicated apparatus peculiar to the female enters upon a condition of functional activity. The growth of this peculiar and marvelous apparatus and the perfect development of which humanity has so large an interest occurs during the few years of a girl's education life. No such extraordinary task calling for such rapid expenditure um, of force, building up such a delicate and extensive mechanism within the organism, a house within a house, an engine within an engine, is imposed upon the male physique at the same epoch. The organization of the male grows steadily, gradually, and equally from birth to maturity. Tell that to parents and middle school teachers. <laughs> the importance of having our methods of female education recognize this peculiar demand for growth, and of so adjusting themselves to it as to allow a sufficient opportunity for the healthy development of the ovaries and their accessory organs, and for the establishment of their periodical functions cannot be overestimated. Clark then went on at great length to remind his readers that the three great systems of the human body must function on a limited bundle of energy and bodily fluids, that when one is overtaxed or expending fluids, the others will wither, that when the female reproductive system is maturing and later in adulthood when it exercises its periodical functions in his language, women must use the other two systems in limited ways in order to accommodate the extensive energy expended by their reproductive systems. It therefore was clear to him that the daily rigors of a male education system were inappropriate for women of childbearing age. Indeed, if women learned and studied like men, he argued they were likely to become sterile or to get sick or die. And yes, he spun many tales of such events actually occurring in his little green book. Almost immediately after Clark's book was released and became a hot seller, Julia Ward Howe edited an anthology of essays responding to sex and education. She, an author, abolitionist, and well-known suffragist, had extended the 1873 offer to Clark to speak at the Women's Club of Boston and was not pleased by the content of his lecture. Her own essay graced the pages of the book she edited, but surprisingly, much of her retort did not differ significantly from Clark. She says, I have known of repeated instances of incurable diseases and even of death arising from rides on horseback taken at that critical period. I have known fatal pulmonary consumption to arise from exposure of the feet in silk stockings at winter parties. Every matron knows and relates these sad facts to the young girls of her charge. They are sometimes heeded, often are not. Nothing in our knowledge of youth would lead us to consider them as a rare occurrence. And yet Dr. Clark, attributes most failures of the function, she's talking about reproduction, and its com uh, concomitant maternity to the school education received by our girls. In short, for her, physical activity might not be appropriate for women while menstruating, but more proof was needed before Howe was prepared to believe that exercising mental acuity had the same negative effects on women's reproductive capacities as did physical activities. Howe's notions, like Clark's, were actually widely accepted in, both in, in their time and then in the following decades, whether because of concerns about the survival of the race among middle and upper class whites, the felt need to protect white women's reproductive capacities in light of immigration and movement of blacks north, fear of men's inability to concentrate when women were around, honestly felt belief that science, then widely believed, is the potential savior of mankind, correctly described the operation of our physiological systems, a desire to protect the educational, professional, and cultural prerogatives of men, or some other cultural factors, there was general agreement among many women and men that our bodies were zero-sum games, that overtaxing one system endangered another, that the task of protecting women was therefore quite a different undertaking than that of protecting men. 
For such believers, it often was a truism that it was better to educate women in a different institution and in a different way. Now, as noted, Clark's theories didn't go uncontested. Though the president of Harvard, Charles Eliot, opposed admitting women to the college because of lack of knowledge about their mental capacities, so he claimed, he did establish a series of lectures, sort of as a test, lectures by faculty members that women were allowed to attend shortly before Clark spoke at the women's club. Indeed, the majority of those attending those lectures turned out to be women. Further pressure arose from members of his own faculty and from the creation of the Women's Education Association of Boston in 1872, an organization with many members related in some way to academics working on the Harvard campus. That led to the offering of exams to women attending the lectures, exams that if passed opened a path to the teaching profession for them. Eventually, the Harvard Annex, the original name of Radcliffe College, was set up in 1879, actually offering the exact same curriculum to women that men took at the college. Though Clark was influential, his words turned out necessarily to be, not to be gospel. Since much of Clark's rhetoric I know seems outlandish to your 21st century ears, I can't leave you with the impression that such attitudes about the capacities of women and men quickly fell by the wayside during the decades before and after the turn of the 20th century. Though always disputed, his views continued to have a significant influence for quite some time. One of many important examples is the Brandeis brief filed in Mueller versus Oregon, which I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard of. A challenge to the constitutionality of an hours limitation law for women and children adopted by the state of Oregon. The Brandeis brief actually was not the first instance in which lawyers marshaled social science evidence in support of a legal argument a belief later falsely nurtured by Brandeis's then young colleague, Felix Frankfurter. A small instance of this strategy was submitted in support of those who successfully challenged the New York hours limitation law in the famous case of Lochner versus New York, dealing with bakeries. That brief took the position that bakery work was quite safe, despite the dust it created, and no, no protections beyond those afforded, of, afforded by the business owners were needed for the men who worked in such environments. So the so-called Brandeis brief actually was assembled by Josephine Goldmark, Brandeis's sister-in-law, and Florence Kelly, both very well-known progressive era reformers active with the National Consumers League. Goldmark and Kelly, and of course Brandeis as counsel, counsel of record, had a bit of legal conundrum to resolve. Lochner was decided in 1905, just two court terms before Mueller versus Oregon was added to the docket. The justices had to be convinced that ours legislation protecting Oregon's women and children was in a different category from similar rules in New York about male bakers. <laughs> Focusing on the physiological differences between men and women was the obvious strategy. While the brief filed by the Oregon Attorney General's office was a traditionally composed document, the Brandeis brief had virtually no legal argument in its 113 pages, only about two pages worth, and they were really not very much like legal argument. One of the short argumentative pa passages graced the opening uh, page of a section entitled The Dangers of Long Hours. It read, the dangers of long hours for women arise from their special physical organization taken in connection with the strain incident to factory and similar work. Long hours of labor are dangers for women primarily because of their special physical organization. In structure and function, women are differentiated from men. Besides these anatomical and physiological differences, physicians are agreed that women are fundamentally weaker than men in all that makes for endurance and muscular strength in nervous energy and the powers of persistent attention and application. Overwork, therefore, which strains endurance to the utmost is more disastrous to the health of women than of men and entails upon them more lasting injury. Following this short legal contention, the brief presented quotations from a lengthy series of publications and studies, interminably long. The tone of a number of them mirrored the, the views of Dr. Clark. Listen, for example, to the words of Dr. George M. Price, a medical sanitary inspector for the health department of the city of New York. The injurious influences of female labor are due to the following factors. One, the comparative physical weakness of the female, female organism. Two, the greater predisposition to harmful and poisonous elements in the, in the trades. Three, the periodical semi-pathological state of health of women. Four, the effect of labor on the reproductive organs. And five, the effects on the offspring. Or take in the statements of Dr. W. Chapman Grigg in a report he wrote for the British Parliament. 
I believe that sterility is one of the greatest evils attached to prolonged hours. I have seen many cases in families where certain members who have pursued the calling of shop girl assistants, that's a salesperson in a store, not a worker in a factory, shop girl assistants have been sterile, while other members of the family have borne children. I know of one case where four members of a family who were shop girls were sterile, and two others in the family, not shop girls, have borne children. It appears to be a most common condition. The National Consumer League strategy worked. The court took the rare step, as I think many of you know, of citing the Brandeis brief at length and adopting its basic theory whole cloth. As Justice Brewer wrote for the unanimous court, that women's physical structure and the performance of maternal functions place her at a disadvantage in the struggle for subsistence, again Darwin, is obvious. This is especially true when the burdens of motherhood are upon her. Even when they are not, by abundant testimony of the medical fraternity, continuance for a long time on her feet at work, repeating this from day to day, tends to injurious effects upon the bottom body, and as healthy mothers are essential to vigorous offspring, the physical well-being of women becomes an object of public interest and care in order to preserve the strength and vigor of the race. The opinion was remarkably short and virtually bereft of any sharp legal analysis, a statement of how obvious it was to the court that men and women were situated differently in their physiology and therefore in their workplace capacities. Now it's very important to recognize that such views were not part of American culture during its founding decades. Women certainly were viewed and legally treated as dependent, seldom seen as import in important arenas of public life, shunted away from places and activities controlled by men, and legally barred from most commercial arenas. And of course, notice was taken that women were often physically less muscular and therefore less strong than men. That notion has been common since the dawn of humanity. But there was little chatter, if any, about imposing limitations upon women because of the development and operation of their reproductive systems, limiting the regularity of their physical or mental capacities outside of the birthing chamber, or about the periodicity of, women, periodicity of women's lives altering their ability to perform physical or mental tasks, or about women's psyches being flighty and episodic. In short, not much was said about their stamina. That made perfectly good sense at the time. Life, largely rural, was rough and rugged. Unless you were very healthy, uh, wealthy, maintaining a household took the labor of everyone present. Children were pressed into service at a young age, raising food, making cloth and clothing, candles, building homes, and other basic necessities typically, typically required an enormous amount of hard, sometimes back-breaking work. It really wasn't until Clark's time after the Civil War that the hard lives of significant numbers of women homemakers began to ease with the arrival of food distribution systems, large-scale commerce, electricity, and other modern conveniences. The transitions are beautifully described in a book by Susan Strasser. Oh, that's Justice Brewer. Susan Strasser's wonderful 1980 book called, 82 book called Never Done. I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite history books. And with the arrival of modern commercial life came some leisure time. The arrival of vacation getaways, female cures in northern New York, and the notion that women needed to rest once a month. Science, of course, often is socially constructed. And for me, there is no better example of that than the views of Dr. Clark and his supporters. By the 1920s, Clark's views about the mental capacity of women were largely out of favor in the recently created discipline of psychology, part of the rise of what was then thought to be science. Studies, many organized by women, demonstrated no difference in educational performance at various stages of a woman's menstrual cycle. Death and diseases of women were shown to be unrelated to exercise of the mind during menstruation, but to other common features of existence on the planet. And of course, women's suffrage had become a reality. But this did not mean that claimed differences in the physical capacities of men and women or the episodic qualities of women's mental acuity disappeared from public discourse. Despite the demise of much of Clark's science, American culture could not rid itself of the notion that women were inherently, naturally less stable and capable than men. The contours of the debate over the Equal Rights Amendment proposed by the National Women's Party after suffrage arrived makes that clear. Most women actually then opposed the ERA because they feared it would lead to the demise of protective legislation adopted after the decision in Mueller. Though opponents of the Equal Rights Amendment 
did not use a Clark-style argument that women's minds and bodies worked in zero-sum ways that barred them from traditionally male activities. They came close. A famous exchange between Retta Child Dorr, a well-known writer and journalist and member of the Women's Party, and Mary Anderson, the first director of the Women's Bureau in the Department of Labor, was published in Good Housekeeping in 1925. Dorr took the position that the most important issues did not involve the hours women worked, but the unequal wages and bad factory conditions afflicting all workers, both men and women. Anderson, on the other hand, wrote that she was a practical rather than a theoretical feminist, a common response among um, social feminists of the time. The real issue for her and others opposing the work of, of the National Women's Party, then actually a quite small but vocal group, and their Equal Rights Amendment were the lack of union protections for women, the fatigue they suffered on the job because they held down two full-time jobs, one at home and one at the office, as it were, usually the factory floor, the inevitable differences arising out of reproductive capacities to them, pregnancy and childbirth, and the weaker nature of women's physiques. William Chafe summarized their arguments and those of their supporters in another classic history book published in 1972 called The Paradox of Change. Reformers and feminists held diametrically opposed conceptions of female equality, Chafe wrote. The Women's Party and its allies were convinced that protective legislation discriminated against women and that women could not be free until they achieved absolute identity with men in all areas of public policy regulated by law. Reformers, in their turn, believed that difficulties of physical and psychological makeup I'm sorry, uh, the difficulties of physical and psychological makeup prevented women from ever competing on a basis of total equality with men, and that special labor laws, therefore, were required if women were to be protected against exploitation and given just treatment in their economic lives. One side was committed to the philosophy that women were exactly the same as men in all attributes relevant to law and public policy, the other to the, to the position that women were so different that their rights should, would be destroyed unless safeguarded by special legislation. Felix Frankfurter summed up the arguments nicely. While a professor at Harvard in 1924, he opined that, quote, nature made men and women different. The woman's party cannot make them the same. Law must accommodate itself to the immutable differences of nature. Such views wove a varied tapestry throughout the rest of the 20th century. They were culturally manipulable depending on understandings of cultural needs. Sometimes notions of women's physical limitations surged to the foreground. At other times, notions of women's enormous capacity for work dominated. The continuing sense that notions of gender equality were in cultural tension with the limits of women's physical and mental constitutions played out in the movement of women into and out of factory um, work during and after World War II which I won't discuss here, but certainly will answer questions if you have some later. The bitter debates over the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s and 80s, and in contemporary arguments about the service of women in the military among a variety of other controversies. Phyllis Schlafly, almost surely the major antagonist opposing the 1970s era ERA, and the Eagle Forum she ran, crafted arguments about, against ratification that echoed the tone of the Brandeis brief, but with a twist. She elevated both the homemaking role of women and their privilege, in her words, as mothers, child bearers, and moral guardians to the status of rights, claimed that the ERA would undermine those rights, and argued that it would deprive women of the protections they needed in order to carry out their God-given roles as mothers and moral guardians of society. It was a spatial as much as a physical argument. Protecting the reproductive necessities of life required that women's bodies and their lives be protected and that their daily lives should often unfold in places isolated from those men normally operated in. And so she crafted arguments claiming that the ERA would require unisex bathrooms and combat level military service, notions that catered to the then widespread fears about the need to protect women from the men that surrounded them, particularly in bathrooms, and the arguments were critical to the failure of the ERA, ERA to gain ratification. Such notions also play a critical rhetorical role for those opposing combat service by women in the military. The familial obligations of women and their lower stamina and weaker physical constitution until re very recently doomed efforts to fully integrate women into military life on the same plane as men. 
and the debate over the propriety of allowing women to assume combat roles, though resolved for the moment by the Obama administration, is hardly over. As the debate on the ERA was nearing its conclusion, President Carter and many other amendment supporters claimed, perhaps in desperation at the apparent oncoming failure of the amendment, that if ratified, it would actually not interfere with the motherly and domestic roles of women serving in the military. That even if the ERA was read to require the registration and draft of women, if men were so obligated, women's actual military service would be organized to protect their motherly role and that they never would be pressed into combat service. Similar arguments surfaced when President Carter supported legislation requiring men and men only to register for the draft in case it was ever reinstated, a rule which is still around. That legislation passed in 1980. Combat was then to, to assume to be men's work. Women were too weak. Maternal instincts were too strong. Menstruation was deemed impossible to handle during combat. Women's emotions were too cyclical. And of course, women lacked the necessary stamina. Rostger versus Goldberg, the 1981 Supreme Court decision um, affirming the male-only registration system was heavily influenced by the debates over both the ERA and the registration um, legislation. Justice Rehnquist, writing for the court, claimed that there could not possibly be any serious issue of gender discrimination in male-only registration. Since the ERA itself would not have required combat service by women, an equal protection violation under the existing Constitution was, therefore, simply impossible, reading back President Carter's position. In writing about this conclusion 26 years ago, I claimed, it is hard to take seriously the notion that Rosker represents a carefully thought out rule about intentional gender discrimination. Rehnquist's presumption that the previously enacted restrictions on women serving in the military um, was um, previously enacted restrictions on women serving in, the, in military in combat roles in the military were constitutionally hardly was commanded. Nothing in the underlying framework of discrimination law prevented either the parties or the court from assuming that the combat restrictions were actually invalid. Rather, the fact that the plaintiffs in building their lawsuit, Justice Rehnquist in composing his majority opinion, and the justices composing their dissents all assumed that the battlefront bar was valid strongly suggests that the cultural norms frowning upon women in the trenches were too powerful to ignore. There is therefore little to support the result in Rosker save the quite obvious stereotypes that women cannot shoot guns, drive tanks, fly airplanes, push middle, missile buttons, or die, as well as men. And so too, uh, I assume that many Republicans challenging Hillary Clinton's physical and mental fitness to assume the presidency would claim that they are not relying upon gender stereoty stereotypes. But it is obvious to me that their challenges to her stamina heavily re rely upon unsupported assumptions about the episodic weaknesses of women that have bored very deeply into the psyche, history, and culture of American society since the end of the Civil War. Thanks very much. So if anybody has questions before we drink, I'd be delighted to... <laughs> Well, that's a good question. I'm not really good about international gender stuff. Well, it seems that everything is a manner to uh, overcome it. Well, um, com combat restrictions, which is the most recent controversy, um, have really only partly been overcome, I think, in Israel and maybe Switzerland. Um, but Israel, but the, the rules for women are different in Israel. The, they're drafted for two, not three years. And their, their roles in the military aren't always the same as that of men, though their service um, is certainly further along than perhaps any other country in the world since they're drafted. Um, th they must serve. So um, Israel is about as close as it comes. And, and I think in the rest of the world, women don't necessarily serve in full combat roles, roles like they do now here. Um, so in, at one level, actually, we've come a little bit further, I think, than most places in the world. I, I don't think women serve in combat roles in most countries. Interesting. I'll have to look it up. Is that it?
Well, maybe so. He was a Bostonian, what can I say? Um, uh, but, but America, by 1880s, 1890s, was becoming urbanized. Um, 1920 was the first census where more than um, half of Americans lived in urban areas. So after 1880, we were well along in, um, in urbanizing. And certainly an urban environment is quite different even at that point in our history from what was going on in, in, the, in rural America. You're absolutely right that, in fact, it's interesting, the suffrage, for example, was adopted at many states. 18 states, I think, adopted suffrage before it became an amendment to the Constitution. Most of those were actually in the West, not, not in the East, New York, had, did not have suffrage until they were commanded to do so by, by amendment of the Constitution. And the Northeast was slow to take up women's suffrage. So um, there is something about these kinds of attitudes about the fragility of uh, women being um, an urbanizing concept in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, in the West, the sort of libertarian streak also has a deep pathway in American culture that's a little different from the East. No, interestingly enough. I mean, the, the primary th thing that was going on in the, in the mills, like Lowell in, in, in New England, was that, at least in, initially, women lived, uh, women workers in the mills, and, and you're right, a lot of women worked as teachers um, uh, early on and in the mills. About a third of young white women in New England worked before they married um, early in our history. Um, they, were, they were shunted off into dormitories. Uh, they, they weren't allowed to, and they were chaperoned. So they weren't allowed to live fully independent lives. Uh, and I think that that was not because of any of the ideas that I'm talking about here. It was because of a desire to protect their virginity, to be you know, so straightforward about it. Uh, since they were away from home and uh, the, the parents obviously were reluctant to see them go, um, and so they wanted them to be protected. It was also an era in which there was a surplus of labor, agricultural labor, because of the invention of very simple devices which hadn't been around before. The shift from wooden to iron plows, for example, and the, the shift from wooden to iron scythes produced an enormous increase in efficiency on American farms in the Northeast. And there be, actually began to be a surplus of labor, which allowed people to go um, into towns for the first time in, in our history fairly early on. But nothing like the level of Boston or New York or Philadelphia later in the century. Ed? There's another uh, classic strain of sexism uh, dealing with, uh, with multiple sex. Uh, there's a famous Puritan speech, as I recall, entitled The Devil in the Shape of a Woman. Uh, and I'm wondering to the extent that you see this strain coming in uh, up to the present in terms of uh, Hillary Clinton being blamed for everything that her husband did. Uh, yeah, I mean, this speech was obviously not about that, but it, it makes me think, your comment makes me think of the Salem witch trials, the, the, the sort of sexuality of women being a threat um, um, in, in certain parts of, of American society, and that notion has certainly been around for a long time, that women are dangerous. Um, so I, 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 it's hard for me to, to deny the possibility that that's playing a role, too, in in, in uh, the, recept the way in which Clinton is being received or in the way in which women in the workplace generally are being received, not just running for high office, but um, in many other uh, roles as well. That, that's an interesting strain. It's, I think you're right, it is present. Obviously, didn't talk about it tonight. Thank you. Other questions? No, shall we drink? Okay, let's do it, thank you.